All right, welcome back party people. Today I'm gonna answer two questions that I often get about electricity. Those two questions are, which way does current actually flow and does it flow at the speed of light? So let's jump right into it. <laughs> Just a quick note here, I'm not gonna cover every detail about electricity. I'm gonna cover some very basic points and I'm gonna cover them in a simple way that you can link together to better understand how current flows in a circuit. Now you will see a lot of this depends on chemistry. So you may wanna brush up on your chemistry a bit before watching this video, but I will try to make it as simple as possible. All right, so suppose we have a piece of copper wire and we slice that into the smallest, tiniest particle that we can that still represents the element copper. And what we would have is a copper atom. So I have a very cartoonish drawing of a copper atom here on the screen, but I think we can get our point across. Now we know a few things about a copper atom because the periodic element chart tells us. So first we know that there are a number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of the atom. And in our case, there are 29 protons. And we know that atoms are net neutral as far as charge, and therefore there must be 29 electrons. So if you count up the number of electrons that are in the shells that are surrounding the nucleus of this atom, then you would also see 29 electrons. Now that configuration of where those electrons lie and which shells, that's already been predetermined by scientists and you can find that information in the periodic element chart as well. Now we know that since a proton has positive charge and electrons have negative charge, neutrons have a neutral charge. So therefore we have an overall net neutral atom here. Now, if we look at how we determine the number of neutrons, we can take the atomic mass of the copper atom, which in this case is 64, and subtract that from the number of protons, and we end up with the number of neutrons that are within the nucleus of this atom. Now, this particular electron that exists in the outer shell here is called a valence electron, and this is called the valence shell. So let's take a look at what we know about the laws of attraction as far as electrons and protons. We know that if you have two like charges, then they repel, and you've probably heard this law of attraction a lot in your life, opposites attract. So if we apply this to our copper atom here, what we find is, is electric force that is holding these electrons in place is created because we have a positive charge in the nucleus of this atom here, and then we have negative charge surrounding. So those forces are attracting each other, and that's what keeps the electrons bound to the nucleus of this atom. Now, as we move further from the center of this atom, the bond or the force that attracts these electrons and protons together becomes weaker. And it becomes so weak that it's possible to influence the valence electron to move out of the shell, the outermost shell, and become a free electron. So let's take a look now. Since we lost an electron, we have more positive charge because we have 29 protons and only 28 electrons. So what we have now is a copper ion, and it carries a positive charge. So an ion is nothing more than an atom that has either gained a more positive charge or a more negative charge. Now this is an important concept as we start to talk about ionic current. All right, so let's take a look at a cross-section of copper wire. So within that copper wire, there's gonna be many, 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 many copper atoms. This is just a simplified diagram, so I can just try to get a point across. All right, suppose we supply a force to this electron such that now it becomes free. We now know that this atom becomes a positively charged ion because it lost one electron, so now it has 29 protons and only 28 electrons. And we know from our laws of attraction that we now have this force attracting this electron in the outer shell that has a weak bond or a weaker bond than the other shells of the atom there. 
and it is being attracted to this positively charged ion because opposite, opposites attract. And you can take that and multiply it across every single atom within that piece of copper wire and you start to see that we now have this electron flow in a certain direction. Now this is an important concept, so keep this in mind as we link the concepts that we learned earlier together with this concept to show you how charge moves through a circuit and how current flows through a circuit. Copper is a pretty good conductor. It's not the greatest. Silver is a great conductor. Now the reason copper is said to be a conductor because it has this structure where this outer shell electron is not as quite tightly bound by electrical force to the nucleus so it's able to be influenced to move become a free electron and move throughout the metal. We have silver, copper, gold, tin. You get the point. Those are all conductors. Conversely we have insulators and some of these insulators air water rubber all right the difference between insulators and conductors is if we take a look at the atom of an insulator the electrons that exist in the orbitals or shells are very tightly bound to the nucleus of the atom so the electric force there is so much so that it can't give up valence electrons to become free electrons therefore there's no electron movement Therefore, we say insulators are not good conductors of electricity. Okay, so let's take a look at a simple DC battery. On the left side here, we have this metal strip that is of one type of metal. We call it the anode. And on the right side here, we have this red strip of metal here in this particular diagram that's of a different type of metal than the anode. We call this the cathode, but just note that these metals are chosen differently along with the electrolyte that exists down in the battery to produce a chemical reaction. So this battery is storing chemical energy and we want to convert that to electrical energy. Now down the middle of this battery here exists a separator and that separator is usually made of some type of plastic but it is porous enough to pass ions. So let's suppose we choose a good conductor, let's say for example copper, and we connect a copper wire from the anode through a load to the cathode. And we're gonna say that this load here is a light bulb and we've got copper wire here. So we know that copper is a good conductor because it allows for that electron movement things start to happen simultaneously. Remember when we talked about our atoms, that electron in the outer shell? Well, we have a more positively charged cathode now that is attracting that electron from that valence shell, so that free electron. So we have these electrons now that are being attracted to the more positively charged cathode. And remember, that's happening throughout the wire and then if we take a look at what's happening on the anode side, we have a more negative charge over here. So as those electrons are moving from the valence shells across the atoms and ions within that copper wire, then we have a force that's attracting these electrons now. So let's remember our copper atom in that outer shell, the valence shell, that electron was not as tightly bound in that outer shell as the rest of the electron. So it was able to be influenced by a force. And remember, our forces, like forces attract. So now we have this electron, this negative charge being attracted to this more positively charged cathode. And remember what happens when we lose the electron in the outer shell of a copper atom. We now have these positive ions in our copper wire, so they have a more positive charge. And what they're doing now is attracting more of the negative charge from the anode. And so what we have is a very well-defined electron flow in this direction from the anode to the cathode. So remember, we take that process and we multiply it across all of the atoms and ions that exist within that copper element there. And uh, you can see that we can generate quite a bit of electron flow.
Now, simultaneously, the chemical reaction that is occurring down in the electrolyte reacting with the cathode metal and the anode metal, we have a similar thing going on. So now as the positively charged cathode starts to attract more negative charge, metal that was chosen for the cathode and this particular electrolyte was engineered for a reason that chemical reaction is producing negatively charged ions and it's similar on the anode side that chemical reaction is producing positively charged ions you're getting a more positively charged anode so the positive charge on this anodes is attracting the negative ions and the negative charge on the cathode is attracting the positive ions. Now, remember we talked about this separator here. This separator allows these ions to actually move through the membrane. And this is what gives us the ionic current flow in our electrolyte. Now, the process that's happening down here, we call it electrolysis. And this does not go on indefinitely. What happens is as, the, as time goes by, the battery loses its ability to actually move charge. These ions that are more negatively charged that are heading for the anode are called anions. And the ions that are more positively charged that are heading toward the cathode are called cations. So now we know the directional flow of electrons is from negative to plus. All right, so let's talk about current flow. Current actually flows in the opposite direction of the electron flow. So that means if we look in our diagram here, we have a current flow in this direction, opposite of our electron flow. All right, so why is it that the current flow is opposite of the electron flow? I'll tell you why. You ever heard of this guy? Mr. Ben Franklin. Back in his day, when he was experimenting with electricity, he assumed that the charge that was moving in the circuit was positive and that it was moving from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So he gave us this conventional current direction from plus to minus, and that has stuck with us throughout history. Now, what he didn't know was the actual charge that was being moved through the circuit was negative and it moved from the negative terminal to the plus terminal. And this is usually referred to as the conventional current direction. All right, let's take a look at a circuit. Now I have two circuits here. We have an AC circuit and we have a DC circuit. All right, this would be like the switch and light bulb that you would find in your home. You have a power line source coming in. It's an alternating current. And the circuit on the right would be like a small battery connected to a light bulb, like a little, let's say it's a flashlight. For our purpose, these circuits demonstrate the exact same thing. Now let's take a look at what happens if we close this switch. Well, in the DC circuit, we know our current starts to flow. Remember, our conventional current notation is current is flowing from plus to minus. So we have this current flow in this direction. We know our electron flow is actually opposite of that. Over in the AC circuit, we have a generator usually producing the current and that's coming from your power provider. And so it's an alternating current. So we get a current in both directions. So when we close this switch and our current starts to flow instantaneously, our light bulb lights in either of these circuits. One might assume that the current flow was traveling at the speed of light. Couldn't be further from the truth. All right, let me talk about two examples that may help you see an alternative way of thinking about this. So you've probably seen these things on desktops before, Newton's cradle. I'm gonna draw some steel ball bearings down here. So there's three in the middle, there's one on each end, and there's a uh, little structure over the top. And they have, wires or strings that are connected to the steel balls like this. So if you pull this ball back and then you release it, then what happens is this ball here almost instantaneously pops out over here. And this is a parallel with what's happening with the electrons in this copper wire. One other way to think about this is, um, let's say you have a tube 
Let's say we fill that tube with some marbles. If we stuff that marble into one side of the tube, then almost instantaneously, a marble on the other side is going to pop out of the tube. And so that's similar to what's going on with the electron flow in the copper wire. All right, that's going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed the content. Till next time, scale up and ride, van up and go. Just remember, everybody needs a plan B. Ciao, ciao for now.